right, well, welcome everybody. We're so excited to have Oberon Zell here with us today. Um, going, he's going to regale us with the mysteries of Mesopotamia. If you don't know uh, Oberon, I, I, uh, you may have been hiding under a rock because he's been with us in our community for as long as our community um, existed. So, so he's uh, definitely somebody that has been um, part of our world for a long time. Oh, was it? Uh, so he's a renowned elder in the global magical community. In 1967, he was the first to claim the identity of pagan incorporating the first pagan church of all worlds, publishing Green Egg magazine. He was instrumental in the coalescence of the modern pagan movement. In 1970, he published the earliest version of the Gaia thesis. In the 1980s, Oberon and his wife Morning Glory resurrected authentic living unicorns. Um, Oberon creates altar figurines and jewelry, and he's the author of Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizards and many other books. He's also founder and headmaster at the Gray School of Wizardry and is now settled in Redmond, Washington. So he's been, uh, he's coming to us from, from there. And let me just get back to the screen so I can reshare. Um, Chloe, I'm gonna put you on mute because there's some background noise and all right, let me share my screen with Oberon slides. All right. I just lost your, uh, you just went muted there. Are we ready for me to begin? <clears throat> Uh, I don't think we're seeing the slides yet. I think screen sharing okay. hasn't started. Uh, Sorry, I muted myself. Yes, I'm just no, get, okay. trying to get the screen share up. Hang on one second. All right, well, let me know when I'm ready to go. Yes, thank you <laughs> I for your patience. Um, no problem. All right, you're ready to go. All right. Well, I'm here to talk about the mysteries of Mesopotamia, part of a book I've been working on called History's Mysteries. So Atlantis, Lemuria, the Garden of Eden, the Great Flood. Are these merely myths and fantasies of paradise lost or actual places that have somehow disappeared from the face of the earth? And what are the famous legends of a great and universal deluge that are found in so many ancient cultures? Could there really have been a vast global inundation that drowned entire populations and submerged settlements throughout the world to be enshrined in legend by the few survivors whose descendants repopulated the world? I've spent my lifetime researching history's mysteries from mythical monsters and peculiar peoples to arcane artifacts in lost lands. In nearly every case, I have found a truth behind the legend a grain of fact like the grain of sand at the heart of a pearl. Here's an image of the world at the peak of the last ice age 21,000 years ago. The great majority of human history, or, or rather prehistory, occurred in a world very different from the one we now inhabit. Up until only 10,500 years ago, vast amounts of the Earth's waters were frozen into continent spanning miles thick sheets of ice covering much of North America and Northern Europe, and ocean levels were hundreds of feet lower than they are today, exposing as dry lands the vast areas of the continental shelves. This was the period of the Verm glaciation, and it lasted for 59,500 years, 10 times longer than all of recorded history. The choice locations for human settlements have always been at the mouths of rivers, which provide fresh water fresh and saltwater fishing, beaches and tide pools for foraging, mussels, crabs, fish, and other edible sea life, and a means of marine and riverine transportation via boats, which were invented early in human prehistory. 
When the last ice age ended 10,500 years ago with a large comet or asteroid impact in the Bahamas, the melting ice raised the sea levels 400 feet and the new coastlines moved hundreds of miles inland, inundating over 10 million square miles of formerly habitable land. Since all coastal communities were thus drowned, those few people who had survived in the uplands passed down legends of sunken lands, lamenting lost paradises. Here's an image of Eurasia during the Verm glaciation, which lasted from 59,000 to 10,500 years ago. Let's get the next slide up here. Today, all such once prime real estates are now submerged hundreds of feet beneath the ocean's waves and also under millennia of sediments still being deposited over them by the rivers that continue to flow inexorably into the seas. Such prehistoric sites are thus rendered inaccessible to archeologists of our time and will have to be excavated by future generations. Some of these may have been quite significant. Submerged megalithic ruins are being discovered in numerous places that were once dry land. These include such structures as the still debated Bimini Wall and other rectangular and pyramidal remnants in various offshore locations. In 1985, an enormous temple-like structure was discovered off the coast of the southernmost Japanese island of Yonaguna Jima. It is over 165 feet long and 65 feet wide, and its foundation lies 80 feet below the surface with its top just 16 feet beneath the waves. A few mysterious ancient monuments, such as the Great Sphinx of Egypt's Giza Plateau and Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, are now being reevaluated as far older than previously thought, extending their origins back further than 10,500 years ago. This is an image of Doggerland beneath the North Sea. Between England and Denmark, a vast inhabited land area was inundated around 8,000 years ago. Now called Doggerland after the Dogger Bank, known as a hazard to sailors and a boon to fishermen, this land lay where now roll the cold waters of the North Sea. During the last ice age, Doggerland was a broad expanse of the continental shelf. A wide undulating plain with a coastline of salt marshes, mud flats and lagoons formed by the meandering rivers and lakes, fed by melting glacial waters from the continental ice sheets further inland. The size of Great Britain, Doggerland may have been the richest hunting, fowling, and fishing ground in all of Europe during the Mesolithic Middle Stone Age cultural era. In recent times, numerous artifacts have been dredged up from the North Sea, confirming human habitation during this time. As sea levels rose after the end of the last glacial period and continental shelves subsided under the weight of water, Doggerland slowly sank beneath the North Sea. A massive submarine landslide called the Storega Slide off the coast of Norway around 6200 BCE caused a catastrophic tsunami which swept over Doggerland and cut through the English Channel, severing the former British peninsula from the European mainland. Any inhabitants of this forgotten country would have been swept away. The hilly Dogger Bank may have remained as an island until as late as 5000 BCE, when it was finally submerged by the Flandrian transgression. Now here's an image of Tolkien's map of Middle Earth, superimposed over Ice Age England and Western Europe. When J.R.R. Tolkien was creating his ancient lost land of Middle Earth for The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, he chose to set it in the 2,500 year period between the ending of the Verm glaciation 10,500 years ago, the fall of Numenor, and the inundation of Doggerland, the lost land of Arnor. Locating the Shire at present day Cambridge, Tolkien's map of Middle Earth is a fairly accurate rendition of Western Europe and the British Isles at that time. The Brandywine River follows the course of the English Channel. To the east, Mordor corresponds to Turkey, and the city of Minas Tirith is, as he stated, located at the site of Troy. However, Tolkien must have had an issue with Spain because he left it off its, his map completely. The Blessed Isles. In Celtic tradition, 
Everything non-mortal existed in the other world, which was always located to the west. These realms, as well as their rulers, were an important store source of underworld mythology. As the influence of Christianity spread, the other world was transformed into a bleak underworld to overthrow, punish, and diminish the power of the old pagan gods in the eyes of the people. As sea levels rose over thousands of years, submerged regions became legendary and eventually mythical. Caves that once led to subterranean chambers where the dead were entombed became inaccessible, remembered only in old stories. Those whose entrances lay above ground became gateways to the underworld, such as the cave of Crua Khan in Connaught, Ireland, through which armies of the dead would come to attack the living. Christians updated the tales claiming that it is through these caves that condemned human souls enter the underworld, the Christian hell. <clears throat> Onovan, the Celtic otherworld, is often called the Kingdom of Shades. It is a series of coexisting realms, like an archipelago of separate islands in a mystical sea. These are the astral equivalents of Britain's most remote island group, the Isles of Scilly, variously described as the Fortunate Isles or the Blessed Isles, owing to their beauty in relatively mild climate. Lying 28 miles off the coast of Land's End, Cornwall, the Isles are Britain's most southwesterly lands. 3,000 years ago, these comprised three large islands, but rising sea levels have submerged most of the land, and they now consist of 54 small islands, of which only five are inhabited relatively sparsely. In the underworld, these realms contain many different beings, gods, and spirits, as well as the dead. The three major regions are Care Wither, Care Fedred, and Aran. These different sectors are separated by seas, mountain rivers, and impassable chasms. Ruled by Eor, king of the waterfalls, Tearful Fawn, the now submerged land under waves, is a twilight world reached through a sinking lake, the Red Cataract. Isad Rod. Its portal is the Shannon River in Ireland. Its beauty may be seen when the surface of the sea is clear as crystal, unrippled by the wind. The seashore has sands of gold and a silver mist of light rests on the mountains. The grass is green as emeralds with bowers of flowers in full bloom. Lemuria. <clears throat> Lemuria is the name of another submerged land that was hypothesized to have extended from Madagascar through India and throughout Indonesia. The name was coined in 1864 by geologist Philip Schlater, Philip Schlater to account for the presence of lemurs only in these now widely separated areas. Lemurs, the Latin name for ghosts, are charming primitive primates in our remote ancestors. While no lost continent ever filled the Indian Ocean Basin, it is true that the modern islands of Indonesia were once mountains of the vast continuous area now called Sunderland, which extended almost to Australia during the ice ages when sea levels were far lower, exposing the continental shelves. The idea of a lost continent in the Indian or Pacific Ocean was picked up by some occult writers who made it the home of various imagined races and creatures. In the 1880s, Madame Helena Blavatsky, who lived from 1831 to 1891, asserted that Lemuria was sunk by the gods to destroy its subhuman inhabitants. In 1894, Frederick Spencer Oliver published A Dweller on Two Planets, which claimed that surviving Lemurians were living in a complex of caves and tunnels beneath Northern California's Mount Shasta and were occasionally seen walking on the mountain in white robes. This belief is still popular today, as can be attested by a visit to any occult bookstore in the town of Shasta, home of Woo Woo. <laughs> Moo. Uh, here is a map of Moo by James Churchward. Moo is the name of another vast landmass imagined to have once existed in the Pacific Ocean, the remnants of which are modern Polynesia. You're a little ahead of me on the slides there. Oh, I am? Okay. This idea was first proposed. There we go. There we are. This idea was first proposed by Augustus Lee Plongeon in um, 1825 to 1908 
And he claimed that his bogus translations of ancient Mayan writings, now back up one, uh, for, you know, you're still you're here, not quite right. Yeah, that's the one I think. Oh, one more. Oh, I see. We're, we're, we just got that's out of the order. one we want, right. I'm, I'm following you. you. <laughs> <laughs> got out of order. No problem. Um, yes, Augustus Lee Plangian claimed that his bogus translations of ancient Mayan writings told of this drowned land whose survivors were the Mayan Indians of the Yucatan Peninsula. The lost continent of Mu was later popularized by James Churchward in 1852 to 1936 in a series of rather preposterous books with that title. According to Churchward, Mu extended from somewhere north of Hawaii to the south as far as the Fijis and Easter Island. He claimed Mu was the site of the Garden of Eden with 64 million inhabitants known as the Nakals. Its civilization, which flourished 50,000 years ago, was technologically more advanced than his own, and the ancient civilizations of Egypt, India, Mesopotamia, and the Mayans were merely the decayed remnants of its colonies. Churchward claimed to have gained his knowledge of this lost land after befriending an Indian priest who taught him to read an ancient dead language spoken by only three people in all of India. The priest disclosed the existence of several ancient tablets written by the Nakals, and Churchward eventually gained access to these records after overcoming the priest's initial reluctance. And if you believe that, I have a nice bridge in Brooklyn I can sell you. Zealandia. Now move back up. In 2017, 11 geologists from New Zealand, New Caledonia, and Australia confirmed the existence of an almost entirely submerged subcontinent to the east of Australia, of which the islands of New Zealand and New Caledonia are the protruding remnants. The name and concept for Zealandia were proposed by Bruce Loyendijk in 1995, and the case for Le Zealandia being a continent in its own right was argued compellingly by Nick Mortimer and Hamish Campbell and their 2014 book, Zealandia, Our Continent Revealed. Well, the total area of 1,900,000 square miles sunken Le Zealandia is the world's largest microcontinent, more than half the size of Australia. However, since it seems to have been completely submerged for the last 23 million years, it cannot be considered as ever having been inhabited by humans. Uh, but perhaps H.P. Lovecraft was on to something when he described a horrific sunken city in the South Pacific in his 1928 short story, The Call of Cthulhu. To quote from his book, The Call of Cthulhu, the nightmare corpse city of Rulie was built in measureless eons behind history by the vast loathsome shapes that seep down from the dark stars. There lay great Cthulhu, and his horde hidden in green slimy vaults. <laughs> Lovecraft, Call of Cthulhu, 1928. Rillier is to characterized by bizarre architecture likened to non-Euclidean geometry, loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart from ours. Uh, today, we use the term hyperbolic geometry, but several modern authors still consider non-Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry to be synonyms. Along those lines, we have the bizarre and mysterious sunken temple complex off the coast of Yoga Yonaguni, Japan, which resembles nothing else on earth. Move up one. This site was discovered by a diver in 1985. In 1996, serious attempts began to map out the structure Findings includes a massive archway of perfectly fitted huge stone blocks, right angle joins, carvings, regularly spaced drill holes, paved streets and stairs with grand staircases leading to plazas surrounded by towering pylons. Some structures resemble stepped pyramids, but with odd angles. In total, five underwater archeological sites have been discovered near three offshore islands. Depths of the ruins vary from 100 to only 20 feet beneath the waves. Many scientists believe that these stone structures are the remnants of ancient cities 
that must have existed during the Ice Age around 10,000 years ago when the sea level was much lower than it is today. In his 22, uh, sorry, 2002 book, Underworld, explorer and researcher Graham Hancock writes, it was the submerged structures of Japan that first awakened me to the possibility that an underworld in history, unrecognized by the archeologists, could lie concealed and forgotten beneath the sea, which was of course my original point of this entire chapter. Hancock draws parallels between Yonaguni and other ruins found beneath the waters of Lake Titicaca, South America, and in Dwarka off the coast of India. If the structures of Yonaguni are indeed the ruins of an ancient city, as they certainly appear to be, the likeliest possibility is the Joman, who inhabited Japan from about 12,000 to 300 BCE, and whose sophisticated culture is often compared to pre-Columbian cultures of the Americas. They are believed to have been the first culture on earth to develop pottery. However, we haven't found any ruins on land comparable to these underwater ones. Lovecraft placed the location of Sunken Rulier at 47 degrees, nine minutes south, 126 degrees, 43 minutes west, close to the Pacific Pole of Inaccessibility, the point in the ocean farthest from any land mass. That's a long way from Japan, but he was supposedly writing fiction. And now we come to Atlantis, the greatest of all the legends. And I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from Plato in the Timaeus. In front of the mouth, which you Greeks call, as you say, the pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. And it was possible for the travelers of that time to cross from it to the other islands and from the islands to the whole of the continent over against them, which encompasses that veritable ocean. But at a later time, there occurred portentous earthquakes and floods, and one grievous day and night befell them when the whole body of your warriors was swallowed up by the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like manner was swallowed up by the sea and vanished. Wherefore also the ocean at that spot has now become impassable and unsearchable, being blocked up by the shoal mud which the island created as it settled down. Well, by far the most famous of all legendary lost civilizations was the fabled island of Atlantis. Its historical existence and location have been debated for over 2000 years, but have never been confirmed. It was first mentioned by the Greek philosopher Plato from who lived from 427 to 347 BCE. And he claimed the story had been passed down in his family from his great grandfather who knew Solon 638 to 558 BCE, a Greek statesman who had learned the account from the priests when he visited Egypt in 560 BCE. Plato wrote down Solon's story around 360 BCE in his dialogues Timaeus and Critias, stating that Atlantis had been destroyed by volcano earthquake and or tsunami about 9,000 years prior to Solon's time, or about 9,600 BCE. According to Plato, the paradisal island of Atlantis belonged to Poseidon, god of the sea. He fell in love with a mortal woman, Clito, and built a palace for her on a hill near the middle of the island, surrounded with circular belts of sea and land, enclosing one another alternately, some greater, some smaller, two being of land and three of sea, which he carved, as it were, out of the midst of the island, and these belts were at even distance on all sides, so as to be impassable for man. That's from the Critias. Clito bore five sets of twin boys who became the first rulers of Atlantis. The island was divided among the brothers with the eldest Atlas becoming the first king of Atlantis. At the top of the hill, a temple was built to Poseidon. Here the rulers met to discuss laws, pass judgments and honor Poseidon. To facilitate travel and trade, a canal was cut through the rings of land and water running south for five and a half miles to the sea. The populous city of Atlantis extended in an 11 mile circle around the outer ring of water. Beyond the city lay a fertile plain 330 miles long and 110 miles wide, 
surrounded by another canal to bring in water from the mountains. Here's a map of Atlantis based on Plato's description, which was published in the New York American, October 20th, 1912. So nuts grew in abundance. Large oh, herds um, of animals, including- to, Excuse me, I'm sorry. We, yeah. Can you go back to sort to the part where it's, you started with Soaring Mountains because your sound cut out, please. Oh, I'm sorry, of course, thank you. Yeah. Here we are. Soaring mountains dotted with villages, lakes, rivers, and meadows surrounded the plain to the north. The mild climate allowed two harvests each year. Many varieties of herbs, fruits, and nuts grew in abundance. Large herds of animals, including elephants, roamed the island. For generations, the Atlanteans lived simple, virtuous lives, but eventually they became corrupted by greed and power. Angered by their immorality, Zeus convened the other gods to determine a suitable punishment. Subsequently, in one grievous day and night, Atlantis, its people, and its memory were swallowed by the sea and vanished. <clears throat> So where and when was Atlantis? Several different locales for Atlantis have been proposed over the years. Plato said that Atlantis had been located beyond the Pillars of Heracles, which was understood to be the Straits of Gibraltar. This would place Atlantis out in the Atlantic Ocean, most likely around the Azores Islands, about 900 miles west of the Portuguese coast. In the book Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, published in 1882, author Ignatius Donnelly proposed that the Azores are the mountaintops of the sunken continent of Atlantis. These rise from a larger foundation called the Azores Plateau, or by mariners, Dolphin Ridge. This Spain-sized region is a discrete block encircled like a plug by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and the entire plateau would have been above water during the Ice Age until an opening of the surrounding rift evacuated the underlying magma and dropped it into the hole. This happened around 10,900 BCE, somewhat earlier than Plato's date. This map of Atlantis is from the Mundus Subterranean by Athanasius Kircher in Amsterdam, 1665. You uh, skip past the map there, there we go. Yeah, thank you. In 2007, planetary geologist Peter Schultz and a team of scientists from Brown University presented evidence that a comet or asteroid exploded over the Earth or slammed into it 12,900 years ago, melting ice sheets, sparking extreme wildfires, fueling hurricane force winds, and triggering catastrophic climate change that killed off the mammoths, giant sloths, saber-toothed cats, and other great beasts of the Ice Age. A thin black mat of carbon sediments dating to 10,900 BCE has been found in more than 50 archeological digs in Canada, California, Arizona, and South Carolina, even in Belgium. The same black mat sediment was found in 10 archeological sites associated with the Clovis people, the earliest humans known in the New World who had crossed over from Scandinavia and who disappeared after that date. Directly beneath the black mat, researchers found high concentrations of magnetic grains, including iridium, charcoal, soot, carbon spherules, fullerenes packed with extraterrestrial helium, and microscopic nano diamonds that could only be formed from intense pressure of an extraterrestrial impact. So according to this scenario, around 12,900 years ago, a comet or asteroid crossed North America scattering debris across the continent along its route and creating the oval-shaped craters known as the Carolina Bays before splitting in two and smashing into the Atlantic Ocean. The impact site is known as the Nari's Abyssal Plain. Its proximity to the Puerto Rico Trench triggered the opening of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, Rift, sorry, releasing undersea magma and spewing vast amounts of volcanic ash into the atmosphere. The consequent depletion of the magma chamber beneath the Azores Plateau caused the subsidence of that volcanic land mass identified by Donnelly as the original Atlantis. 
As a result of this impact, the Earth's axis was shifted so that the North Pole, which had been in Hudson Bay, moved to its present location in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. The magnetic pole is still catching up. And here's a map that shows the Azores Plateau and the Ice Age coastlines of the Atlantic Ocean at that time. During the Ice Age, large portions of Antarctica were ice-free and temperate, and some serious researchers place Atlantis there. In Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, published in 1966, Professor Charles Hapgood of King College, New Hampshire, noted that Antarctica appears on ancient nautical charts that long predates the discovery of Antarctica by Captain James Cook in 1773. Some of these maps appear to show coastal features now hidden beneath the ice. Hapgood proposed that these charts were constructed from ancient source maps originating with the sophisticated seafaring culture existing as early as 7,000 BCE, and they had been copied and recopied over many thousands of years. Hapgood pointed out that core samples from the Ross Sea area in Antarctica include pollen, indicating a relatively temperate climate as late as 4,000 BCE. He postulated that the ice only fully engulfed Antarctica following a polar shift around 9,500 BCE, coinciding with the end of the last ice age. Schultz's findings would correct this dating to 10,900 BCE. Based on Hapgood's theories of a pre-glacial Antarctica and a polar shift at the end of the ice age, Canadians Rose and Rand Flem Off proposed in their 1995 book, When the Sky Fell, that Plato's Atlantis was actually Antarctica. They pointed out that the polar continent matches Plato's description in the Timaeus of an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together. Furthermore, Atlantis certainly lies beyond the Pillars of Heracles, as Plato reported. However, the complete absence of any evidence of human structures or habitation in Antarctica pretty well refutes the argument for this identification. Still other researchers place Atlantis in South America and point to certain geophysical features on the Bolivian Altiplano that match elements of Plato's description, as well as the ruins of Tiahuanoco, an ancient city considered by many archeologists to be the oldest in the world. Only 10% of its more than 400 acres of ruins have been excavated. In the distant past, Tiahuanoco was a flourishing port at the edge of Lake Titicaca, which, whose coastline has since receded 12 miles and dropped 800 feet. The lake continues shrinking from evaporation as no rivers flow from it. In 1980, Hugo Rojo, a Bolivian author and scholar of pre-Columbian structures, announced the discovery of archeological ruins 45 to 60 feet beneath the lake surface. Polish-born Bolivian archaeologist Hans Schlindler Bellamy concluded that the Tiruanaco culture reached back 12,000 years before the present era. Here's a map of Tiruanaco and Lake Titicaca showing the inland sea that filled the uh, Amazon basin. Salt deposits indicate that during the Ice Age, this lake was part of a vast inland sea that filled the entire Amazon basin and Tiwanoko would at that time have been a seaport. But after the impact of 10,900 BCE, the entire continent of South America was tipped as the continent was moved further westward over the Pacific tectonic plate. The West Coast rose thousands of feet, the Andean upheaval, spilling the inland sea out into the Atlantic and raising Tiwanoko to its present height of 13,300 feet above sea level. Interestingly, papyrus reeds found elsewhere only in Egypt grow in profusion along the shores of Lake Titicaca, and the local people construct boats from these that are virtually identical to those used in Egypt for millennia. Whether or not Tiwanoko can be legitimately identified with Plato's Atlantis myth, it is certainly indicative of an advanced level of civilization during the later Ice Age including sufficient seafaring skills to have imported papyrus all the way from Egypt. Here's a map of ancient South America from James Churchward's Children of Mu in 1932. Now, the most widely accepted identification of Atlantis today is that of the Greek archeologist Spiridon Marinatos, 
proposed in 1939 that Plato's description of the Atlantean civilization and its cataclysmic destruction seemed very much like that of Bronze Age Minoan Crete, located at the southern edge of the Aegean Sea. Just 70 miles north of Crete is a volcanic island once known as Callisti, the prettiest, and now called Thera or Santorini. Atlantis means land of the pillar. There were four active volcanoes in the ancient Mediterranean world whose rising plumes of smoke were regarded as the pillars that supported the great bowl of the heavens. These were Etna in Vesuvius in Italy, Methana in Greece, and Thera, Atlantis, in the Aegean. <clears throat> in 1628 BCE, an enormous volcanic explosion 10 times the size of the 1883 eruption of Krakatoa in Indonesia, obliterated the entire central area of the island and devastated the magnificent Minoan civilization. The detonation hurled a plume of ash and rock 20 miles into the stratosphere, turning day into night over the Eastern Mediterranean. Akrotiri and other settlements on Thera were buried under as much as 100 feet of ash. Huge tsunamis drowned coastal Greece, Syria, and Egypt, and the volcano below the horizon was visible for hundreds of miles as a pillar of smoke by day and fire by night. That's from Exodus 13, 21, because this was the event recorded in the Bible as the Exodus and the 10 plagues that beset Egypt, and even the parting of the Red Sea, a clear description of a tsunami, were all due to this eruption. Unlike in Pompeii and Herculaneum, which were similarly destroyed by the eruption of Vesuvius, another of the four pillar volcanoes in the year 79 CE, archaeologists have found few bodies in the excavations on Thera from the 1628 BC eruption. Evidently, several early rumblings and many eruptions warned the populace in time to evacuate the island. The fleet was employed to convey everyone to Crete itself, so all the ships were in harbor when the final devastating detonation blew the world apart. The resulting ash fall and tsunami utterly obliterated the coastal towns and harbors, and that was the end of Minoan Crete and the fall of Atlantis. Here's an image of Thera as Atlantis before and after the eruption. Marinatus argued that Solon may have confused the Egyptian glyphs for hundred and thousand, and that the destruction of Atlantis should have been read as having occurred 900 years earlier rather than 9,000. If so, then the proper date would have been 1600 BCE, the time of the Thera eruption. Reducing the figures of thousands to hundreds also brings Plato's reported dimensions of Atlantis into accord with those of Thera. And now we come to Mesopotamia and the gates of Eden. <coughs> Ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Assyrians, and Hebrews all told of an earthly paradise that had once existed, but had been lost forever. According to the Bible, Genesis 2, 8 through 14, Yahweh God planted a garden in Eden, which is in the east, and there he put the man he had fashioned. Yahweh God caused to spring up from the soil every kind of tree, enticing to look at and good to eat, with the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden. A river flowed from Eden to water the gardens. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is pure. Bdellium and onyx stone are also found there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The third river is named the Tigris, and it flows to the east of Asher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. And that is the biblical description. Now, this seems to indicate a pretty precise geographical location. I should bring up the next slide. Just downstream from the confluence of four well-known rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, of course, are famous to this day, as they form the boundaries of Mesopotamia, meaning the land between the rivers. And they meet at the head of the Persian Gulf. But where are the Pishon and Gihon rivers? 
No other rivers flow today through the desert sands to join the Tigris and Euphrates. Dr. Juris Zarians of Southwest Missouri State University believes that the Garden of Eden now lies submerged under the waters of the Persian Gulf. He cites Landsat satellite images, which reveal a fossil river that once flowed through Northern Arabia and through the now dry ravines, wadis, which modern Saudis and Kuwaitis know as the Wadi Rima and the Wadi Batin. Furthermore, as Genesis says, this region was once rich in bdellium, an aromatic gum resin that can still be found in North Arabia, and gold, which was still being mined in that area in the 1950s. So the now dry Rima Batin River would be the Pishan. Zarines believes the biblical Gihon is the Karun River, which has its source in Persia, modern Iran, and flows southwesterly toward the present Gulf. The Karun also shows in Landsat images and contributed most of the sediment forming the delta at the head of the Persian Gulf until it was diverted in 1765 to the Hafar Channel, which had been dug in the year 986 to facilitate shipping between Avaz and Basra. During the last ice age, vast amounts of water became locked up in continent-spanning ice sheets and sea levels for, fell by 400 feet. So what is now the Persian Gulf was dry land all the way to the Strait of Hormuz. It was irrigated not only by the still extant Tigris and Euphrates, but also by the lost Gihon, the Pishan and their tributaries from the Arabian Peninsula in Iran. The Sumerians who invented writing over 6,000 years ago recorded the legend of a luxuriant and lovely land called Dilmun, located on somewhat elevated ground along the eastern coast of Arabia. Dilmun enters the epics and Sumerian creation myths of the third century BCE. The by then ancient myth of a land of plenty, of eternal life and peace, had lodged firmly in the collective consciousness and with a specific locale. Here's an image from my cylinder seal of Enki and Utu bringing fresh water to Dilmun. In the Sumerian epic Enki and Ninhursag, Enki is Lord of Ab, fresh water, is living with his wife Ninsikil in the paradise of Dilmun. Here's a quote from the epic. The land of Dilmun is a pure place. The land of Dilmun is a clean place. The land of Dilmun is a clean place. The land of Dilmun is a bright place. He who is alone lays himself down in Dilmun. The place after Enki is clean. That place is bright. Like the biblical garden of Eden, Dilmun was a peaceful place where the lion killed not, the wolf snatched not the lamb, unknown was the kid killing dog, unknown was the grain devouring boar. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Dilmun had no water. And Enki heeds the appeal of Ninsakil, who is the goddess of the land, and orders the sun god Utu to bring fresh water from the earth for Dilmun. As a result, her city drinks the water of abundance. Dilmun drinks the water of abundance. Her wells of bitter water, behold, they are become wells of good water. Her fields and farms produce crops and grain. Her city, behold, it has become the house of the gods and quays of the land. This is from Samuel Noel Kramer's book on Sumerian mythology published in 2007. Around 6,000 to 5,000 BCE came the Neolithic wet phase when rains returned to the Gulf region following a long arid period. The lands of what are now Eastern and Northeastern Saudi Arabia and Southwestern Iran, which had been dry and barren, became green and fertile. Foraging populations moved into this paradisal region where the four rivers now ran full. Agriculture began here as humanity's first garden was planted in the lush and fertile valley that we remember as Eden. But after 5000 BCE, the continued melting of Ice Age glaciers precipitated a sudden rise in global sea level called the Flandrian Transgression. The Persian Gulf began to fill in with water, finally reaching its present day level about 4000 BCE having swallowed Eden and all settlements along the Gulf Coast and eventually rising into the central southern regions of today's Iraq and Iran. I want to roll back up to that previous slide there. See this. 
Humankind was driven from the Garden of Eden as Eden disappeared beneath the rising waters. Interestingly, this sequence corresponds closely to the 4004 BCE date calculated for the creation by James Usher, the Anglican Archbishop of Armagh in Northern Ireland. Okay, move down to uh, uh, slide 22. The modern world first learned of Dilman when scholars deciphered cuneiform tablets from the library of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh, an ancient Assyrian stronghold in modern Iraq, excavated by archaeologist Austin Henry Layard in the 1840s. Some of these tablets, comprising a narrative designated as the Epic of Gilgamesh, describe a great flood, a mighty Sumerian hero king, and his search for the tree of life. In the epic, King Gilgamesh goes down from Uruk and Sumer to Dilmun on the Gulf, where he had been informed by Utnapashtim, the nigh-immortal Sumerian Noah who had survived the great flood, that the tree of life still grew beneath the waves, and a sprig from it would grant immortality. Gilgamesh dives down, finds the tree, and recovers a sprig from it, possibly coral, which is associated with immortality. Exhausted from this labor, he collapses on the shore to sleep, whereupon a serpent comes along and steals the sprig, leaving its old skin behind as it disappears into a hole. This explains why snakes can shed their skins and rejuvenate themselves. <clears throat> so, human civilization and the art of writing first arose in the fertile plains beneath, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers where the ancient Mesopotamians believed in an afterlife in a subterranean realm beneath our world. It was to this land known as Arala, Ganzer, or Irkala, the great below, that everyone went after death, regardless of social status or their actions performed during life. The bodies of the dead decompose in this afterlife as they would in the world above. <clears throat> <clears throat> Irkala, Arcadian, uh, also Irkala, Irkalaya, Kur, Sumerian, also Kermugaya or Ersetu, Akkadian, Ersat, many other terms, is the Mesopotamian underworld from which there is no return. This is ruled by the goddess Ereshkigal and her consort, the death god Nergal. In Babylonian mythology, from about 620 to 539 BCE, Urkala was another name for Ereshkigal, who ruled the underworld alone until Nergal was sent to her realm, seduced and married her. Both the deity and the realm were called Irkala, much like how Hades in Greek mythology became a name for the underworld from the god who ruled it. <clears throat> the gates into and out of Irkala lay at the equinoxes, when day and night are equal at the opposite ends of the great arch of the Milky Way. I'll move this up to the next slide here. <clears throat> the Milky Way was called the River of Souls. After death, souls must wait for the next autumn equinox to enter Irkala through the rising gate of Sagittarius. A return to Earth through reincarnation could only occur through the Gemini exit gate at spring equinox. Urkala was a place of neither punishment nor reward, but was just a drearier version of life above. As the subterranean destination for all who die, Urkala was similar to the Hebrew Sheol or the Greek Erebus. It differed from more hopeful versions of a paradisal afterlife envisioned by the contemporary Egyptians and later in Hellenism, Christianity, and Islam. In Urkala, the dead were considered merely weak and powerless ghosts. The myth of Inanna's descent into the underworld relates that dust is their food and clay their nourishment. They see no light where they dwell in darkness. Because the Anunnaki's first sage Adapa unknowingly refused the gift of immortality, all men must die and true eternal life is only for the gods. The shades or spirit of the deceased were known as Gideon in Sumerian and as Etemu in Akkadian. Gideon were created at the time of death, taking on the memory and personality of the dead person. 
They traveled to Irkala, where they led an existence similar in some ways to that of the living. The Gideon had houses and could meet with deceased family members and associates. Gideon spent some time traveling on their journey through the portal to the another world, often having to overcome obstacles along the way. They passed through seven gates, leaving articles of clothing and adornment at each gate where guardians exacted tolls for their passage and kept anyone from going the wrong way. The Anunnaki, the court of Urkala, welcomed each Gideon and received their offerings. The court explained the rules and assigned the ghosts their fate or place. Another court was presided over the sun god Shamash, who visited the netherworld at night on his daily round. Shamash might punish Gideon, who harassed the living, and might award a share of funerary offerings to forgotten ghosts. The Babylonians believed that life in the underworld could be made more tolerable if the surviving relatives made regular offerings of food and drink. If the relatives failed to make such offerings, the ghosts could become restless and visit sickness and misfortune on the living. The ghosts of people who had no children to make these offerings would suffer more, while people who died in fire or whose body lay unburied in the desert would have no ghosts at all. The Epic of Gilgamesh was compiled by a Mesopotamian priest called Sinliki Unanini, Sin the Moon God Accepts My Prayer, sometime between 1300 and 1000 BCE, out of older tales and legends. Tablet 11 of the epic includes a detailed account of the great deluge as told to Gilgamesh by Udnapishtim. It is taken almost word for word from an 18th century BCE Akkadian epic named after its protagonist, Atrahasis, whose father, Ubaratutu, was king of Shurapak before the flood. Tablet three of the Atrahasis epic tells how Enki, god of fresh water, instructs Atrahasis, whose name means extremely wise, to dismantle his house and build a large boat to escape the flood planned by the wind god Enlil to destroy the ever burgeoning human population. This ark is to have a roof, upper and lower decks, and be sealed with bitumen. Atrahasis builds the ark, takes his family and livestock aboard, and seals the door. Enlil's storm comes and the land is inundated, frightening even the gods. After seven days, the flood subsides and Atrahasis emerges and offers sacrifices to the gods. Enlil is furious with Enki, but Enki argues, I ensured the preservation of life. Enki and Enlil agree on other means for controlling the human population in the future. The very earliest version of the flood myth is preserved only fragmentarily in the Eridu Genesis, written in Sumerian cuneiform and dating to the 17th century BCE during the first dynasty of Babylon when the written language was still Sumerian. In this version, the ark building hero who saved his family and animals is called Zia Sudra. Of course, the Western world is most familiar with the deluge story. Let's see the next slide. Through the later account of Noah given in the Bible. According to Genesis 6 verses six through eight, quote, Yahweh regretted having made man on the earth and his heart grieved. I will rid the earth's face of man, my own creation, Yahweh said, and of animals also, reptiles too, and the birds of heaven, for I regret having made them. But Noah had found favor with Yahweh. So Yahweh instructs Noah to build a great boat of gopher wood, the ark, three decks high with a roof over it and seal it with pitch, bitumen. He tells Noah to take aboard his family and seven of each kind of clean animal and bird and two a male and female of each kind of unclean animal. According to Genesis 7, verses 11 through 12, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month and on the 17th day of that month, that very day, all the springs of the deep, great deep broke through and the sluices of heaven opened. It rained on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Verses 18 through 19 go on to read, the waters rose and swelled greatly on the earth and the ark sailed on the waters. The waters rose more and more on the earth so that all the highest mountains under the whole of heaven were submerged. 
And in verse 24 of the same chapter, the waters rose on the earth for 150 days. When the flood waters eventually subsided, Noah's Ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, which is located in modern Turkey. Udnapishtim's landed on Mount Nisir in Iraq, e Kurdistan, only a few hundred miles away. Noah released a raven once and a dove twice. Udnapishtim released three birds, a dove, a swallow, and a raven. Noah's youngest son, Sam, was said to have had four sons, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. According to Genesis, their descendants became those respective people, Cushites, Africans, Egyptians, Putians, Persians, and Canaanites, physicians, Phoenicians, <laughs> Phoenicians. James Usher, who lived from 1581 to 1656, who was the Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland, dated the deluge of Noah very precisely to the year 2349 BCE. But the historical reign of King Gilgamesh of Uruk is believed to have been much earlier than that, approximately 2700 BCE, and the flood was already a distant legend by his time. So if the great deluge did in fact occur, when would this have happened? In the epic, Atrahasis was said to have been the son of Ubaratutu, who was the last antediluvian king in Shurapak, which is modern Telfara, Iraq, before the flood swept over. Excavations at that site have in fact discovered evidence of extensive flooding, radiocarbon dated to about 2900 BCE, 200 years before Gilgamesh. The flood deposits extend as far north as the city of Kish, interrupting the continuity of settlement. The epic goes on to say, after the flood had swept over and the kingship had descended from heaven, the kingship was in Kish, where the next king after the flood was Nagushur. A date for the deluge of about 2900 BCE makes perfect sense in terms of the sequence of Sumerian kings and the accounts in the epics of Gilgamesh and Atrahasis. <clears throat> Lately, however, a controversial new explanation for the del legend of the Great Deluge has been proposed by William Ryan and Walter Pittman, two senior scientists from Columbia University. They postulate that rising sea levels caused a massive transfer of water from the Mediterranean into the Black Sea about 5600 BCE. Funneled through the narrow Bosporus, 10 cubic miles of water poured through each day 200 times what flows over Niagara Falls. The Bosporus flume roared and surged at full spate for at least 300 days. The Black Sea rose about six inches a day until 60,000 square miles of farmland were inundated. The Black Sea's level was raised hundreds of feet, changing it from a landlocked freshwater lake into a saltwater inland sea connected to the world's oceans. Such a flooding would have had catastrophic effects on the people living around the area of the Black Sea, triggering mass migrations across Europe and the Middle East. Many researchers now believe the story of the great deluge in the epics of Gilgamesh, Atrahasis, and Noah had its origin in this cataclysmic event. Shells of nine species of saltwater and freshwater mollusks from the Black Sea were radiocarbon dated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. They found that the saltwater species ranged in age from 2,800 to 6,820 um, years. And oh, Ron, we lost your voice again. Um, Hopefully you will come back quickly. O'Bron, you there? Can you hear me? Um, hopefully you will come back. And, oh, I think we might have we might have lost O'Bron for a moment. So hopefully he'll figure that out and come back on. Amara. Yes. Um, might I ask, because I would love to see these slides in a bit more detail. May I please ask kindly that you um, that you can open them to full view? 
I don't seem to be able to do that, but I could post them on the website afterwards. Would that be okay? Doesn't seem to be wanting me to. You are. Are you on? A, are you able to open Google Slides to present the? And then, and then, um, you press present, and it will take up the whole screen in that top corner, on the right. Yes. Still waiting for Thank you so much. No problem. Um, I'm not sure how to get in touch with him to let him know that he's not that he dropped off. I think that's where we were. Um, hmm. Go forward, forward one, one more, more slide, slide to the, the black, black sea. sea. Yeah, sorry. Yep, there you go. Does that work for you? Um, Gaia, are you still on the line? Can you unmute yourself for a minute if you are? Okay, I'm going to mute myself for a moment and see if I can get in touch with him. I'm going to take a couple minute break if anyone needs to stretch and then we'll come back. The blessings and burdens of the online landscape. 